FX Medicine is evolving. As we continue to grow, it's important to us that we remain clinically relevant to your practice. So if you know of an expert you want to hear from, let us know. You can contact us on fxmedicine.com.au, Facebook or Instagram. This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only and is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. FX Medicine, I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Joining us today is Joanne Kennedy, who's a naturopath specialising in methylation and histamine intolerance. From her Sydney CBD practice, she now sees patients both nationally and globally because of her down-to-earth, down-to-earth explanation of what's really going on. Welcome, Joanne. How are you? Hi, Andrew. I'm really well. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Pleasure. An absolute pleasure. Now, you're well renowned for your simple explanations, um, particularly to do with homocysteine. So let's go first through the role of homocysteine in methylation. Okay, so homocysteine has two really important roles. Firstly, it makes methionine, which goes on to make S adenosyl methionine, or SAMI as we know it, which yep. is methyl donor. But homocysteine is, we need to also think about homocysteine as a sulfur-based amino acid. So we can think about it as a sulfur storage molecule in the body. And sulfur, as we know, is extremely important for sulfation. It's extremely important for making glutathione, the body's major antioxidant. And it is also important for making taurine. So there's a lot of really important roles for homocysteine, both for methylation and both when it comes to um, detoxification, inflammation and antioxidant support. Okay, so what are, what are the implications of low homocysteine? So when homocysteine is low, what is happening is that the body's requirement for sulphur is upregulated, it's high. And clinically, we usually see this with a increased need for glutathione due to inflammation and oxidative stress. And that can be coming from chronic gut issues, heavy metals. Um, I see endometriosis will do it often, girls with endometriosis, because of all the inflammation will drive homocysteine down. And what what homocysteine is doing, it's donating the sulfur to cysteine for cysteine to go on to make glutathione to sequester all the free radicals that occur Mm. with the inflammation. Um, So what happens is homocysteine starts to become low and you become deficient because your need for cysteine is so high. Yeah. Okay. Then what happens when homocysteine is low, you don't have enough homocysteine to create methionine to go on to create SAM for methylation. So we become sort of deficient in our, in our sulfur-based amino acids as well as sort of having issues with methylation at the same time. Okay, so just an interesting point. I, I wonder if this has any correlation, but what about things like trauma? Um, you know, anything from sports injuries to burns where you've got a massive amount of tissue damage and your, your body is going to require sulfur at least um, certainly mm. amino acids, to help repair the damage and, and help repair collagen. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I would, I would say, you know, I would always test homocysteine in those people, right. definitely, because, you know, the, their requirements for sulfur and for glutathione are going to be really, really high. I mean, I don't see burns victims in my clinic. Um, I don't specialise in sport either. But definitely if you're treating those people, looking at homocysteine levels, to really understand, well, you know, what their need for glutathione support is, um, would be really beneficial clinically. So the thing that can happen when the these pathways upregulated is that this, the the need for sulfur is so high, and the, and the sulfur the, these pathways run fast. So these people can sometimes feel like they can't tolerate a lot of sulfur, ah, sulfur ah. foods, yep. which is really interesting because they really need 
sulfur, so mm. certain brassica vegetables, red meat, eggs, but sometimes they can't tolerate the sulfur because it's actually it's being used in the body so quickly that they can actually feel quite sick from eating it, but they really need it. So people like this can sometimes benefit from taking like a transdermal glutathione because glutathione is, is a sulfur-based molecule. So sometimes when people take glutathione, they can feel quite unwell. So people like that would probably really benefit from um, sort of a transdermal yeah. um, glutathione. But the other really important thing we need to know about when, when homocysteine starts to drop is that the enzymes, this, um, the sister beta synthase and the cystathione lysase enzymes, these enzymes are B6 dependent. So when you start running that pathway, when glutathione starts, sorry, when homocysteine starts to drop, you are churning through your B6. Right. And you become deficient in B6. And that's going to have huge implications for mood as we know that B6 is important for the synthesis of all neurotransmitters. Yeah. It's also really important for the um, synthesis of progesterone. It's a huge mood issues. But what we also see is that people can start to build up oxalates because you really need B6 to break down oxalate. Okay, And then what happens is when the oxalates get high, they actually start dumping sulfur in the urine and you become even more deficient even in sulfur. Even worse. So if these, these patients are tricky because their requirement for sulfur is so high and they can't tolerate sulfur. So you need to sort of try and unravel what is causing the need for these sulfur amino acids. So what is, why do they need a lot of glutathione yeah. in particular? Can so, I just go... you know, clinically, so clinically, you don't actually, you know, clinically a lot of people with low homocysteine don't necessarily have issues with, with sulfur and tolerating sulfur. It just, it can happen. And, and that, when it does happen, it's tricky. Yeah. Can I go back to what you said about transdermal glutathione? Does that really stink? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. I actually haven't smelled that. It probably does. <laughs> <laughs> because oral glutathione certainly has a sulfurous... <laughs> So yeah, it's gross. Yeah, it's not nice at all. People don't. People generally don't like. Well, generally they don't like it. But if they need it, they feel so good on it that they don't care. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, they don't care. You know, like there's so many things going around in my mind when you spoke about this low. Uh, so forgive me. This increased need for sulfur, and a, a drop in homocysteine. And I was wondering about even you know, the ongoing depression of after a heart attack or, or, or autoimmune diseases and things like that, that I'm not saying it's the cause of, but certainly a component of. Is that, would you f agree with that? Or? You know, anyone that's got an in, sort of inflammatory condition, which is most of the patients that are going to come to your clinic, yeah, you should be, tr you should be testing homocysteine because if it's really low, that's where you start. You know, this is where you start looking at, you know, supporting, trying to reduce the inflammation, supporting them with some N-acetylcysteine if they can tolerate it, glutathione if they can tolerate it. You need to actually start working on that pathway to free up homocysteine. So you can do that by well, treating inflammation, oxidative stress, providing with some N-acetylcysteine and zinc and selenium to help regenerate glutathione, some glutathione as well, if, if, if that's what you would like to do. Supporting that can actually help take the load off homocysteine. So you're giving cysteine, the sulfur, amino acid, mm -hmm. that will convert into sulfite as well, right, for sulfation. And then your you can see the homocysteine will start to come up. So if you retest it, hopefully the homocysteine will start to come up. And that's sort of a marker of how well you're doing it at reducing the inflammation and oxidative stress and and saving the sulfur and, and, and conserving the sulfur. Because yeah. the sulfur you also need to make taurine and, and for sulfation and all these pathways. So you need you need to be able to make sure you've got enough sulfur for all the important roles that it does. So looking at homocysteine levels is a good place to start. And you know you need before before you even start treating methylation, giving methylfolate, methyl B12, SAMI, you really need to understand what your homocysteine levels are because if you start giving methyls, um, particularly SAMI, it's going to start dropping your homocysteine even lower because SAMI will promote that pathway. 
So it's a bit, it's a bit tricky, but mm. you need you need to test bef- so that you understand high, low, and, and what's actually going on. Right. Before and you before you start treating methylation. Yeah. And when we talk about homocysteine, what's the lowest that you'll allow? Like a six. Or- oh, look, you know, yeah, you know, if someone comes in at six, I'm not that I'm not that worried about it. Okay. You know, six six to um, but when it starts dropping five point five five four, you know, the autistic children will have homocysteine down at like three. You know, they've got huge problems with oxalates and yeast. Well, yeast actually contains its own oxalate. Mm. So they have huge problems with that pathway, oxalates and sulfur and sulfur dumping, they've got huge problems. So, you know, you don't often see it at three, mm. but the autistic kids will have it at three but if i've got someone that comes in with a homocysteine at at five i'm like that's you know that's that's not good um and and you see it in endometriosis all the time all the time low homocysteine yeah low homocysteine because they just the inflammation is huge and they're you know they just they're trying to sequester all the inflammation and oxidative stress that occurs in in endometriosis and you know so many of these women do feel so much better on glutathione it's hard to get i don't really focus on getting it up in these girls because it's just it's it's you know there's other things to look at but you know you you this is why they often feel so much better on glutathione is because they need for this sulfur-based amino acid and the sulfur um, to support glutathione is is really high in these girls. And what percentage of patients do you see that have low homocysteine compared to high homocysteine? Because we're all sort of caught up on high homocysteine and bringing it down. That's right. Um, I probably see more low, really? to be honest. Yeah, I often do because the pe- people are coming to me with gut, huge gut issues. Yeah. Histamine, I mean, they've got histamine issues. So what's going on with histamine? It's right. mainly gut. You know, it's a dysbiotic gut microbiome and all the inflammation that that causes, a a lot of huge histamine release, whether they know that they've got a histamine problem or not. Um, So it's the histamine stuff, gut, um, you know, a lot of sort of, it's sort of, I see a lot of women with endometriosis. So a lot of the inflammatory conditions, you'll see um, sort of a low homocysteine. Um, Don't, yeah, no, interestingly enough, sort of, I'd say slightly more low than, than high. Right, yeah. right. And the other question I have about homocysteine is, is homocysteine tested alone or do you test with like, you know, methylmalonic acid, MMA, anything like that? Do you ever use it in combination with other tests? Yeah, so, you know, if you're going to do a workup with someone, if you're going to start looking at methylation and what you need to do, you would definitely be testing active B12, red blood cell folate, levels um you know plasma zinc serum copper is really important because zinc's a cofactor in you know the, the methylation pathways plasma you know, zinc plasma zinc serum copper yeah <laughs> um, i get consensus on that one. <laughs> oh, okay oh, that's just what i've been taught oh, no. <laughs> um, and, and, fa- and and fasting homocysteine so you know there's no point in giving people methyls methylfolate methyl b12 when their homocysteine's low because you know, it makes these people feel worse because it starts stimulating, you know, the production of SAMI. SAMI upregulates CBS enzyme. It can start dropping your homocysteine even lower. Plus, if your homocysteine is low, you're, you're highly likely to have gut issues, right, really? And, you know, and histamine issues because of all the inflammation. You give methyls, it breaks down histamine and it will break it down quick, smart, but you're not treating the cause of the histamine. So it breaks it down and it often breaks it down in, in the central nervous system in the brain. So you, this is why people can get um, headaches and migraines and insomnia and irritability, anxiety from methyls because it's breaking down histamine. Yeah, this really explains the, um, um, not contract, what's the word? Uh, the flipped expected outcomes to using the activated bees which we're all taught is the best forms of the bees yeah. to use oh absolutely it's it, it's it's not great for everybody and, and you know i i am pulling my patients off methyls that they've been prescribed more than i'm giving them because they're prescribed willy-nilly they're prescribed without testing homocysteine anyone with inflammation and, and, and signs of high histamine definitely don't 
give them methyls at least straight away because it'll just make them feel worse most most of the time. Because okay. with histamine, it's the Dow enzyme in the gut that really is is taking the brunt of, of what's going on with histamine. And if you don't fix that, histamine gets into the brain, you break it down with methyls, and it comes out as an adverse reaction. Right. Um, but, of course, the activated B vitamins are those which are found in food. So has it got to do with dose or oh, yeah, yeah. It would have the to combinations do with, they use? Yeah, it would have to do with dose. It's not happening from food. No, right. it's not happening from food. Um, it, it would have to be dose. And, and, and you know, the thing is, they, they, these people need, they need the methyls. They need them. But you, you need to go in slowly. So with folinic acid instead of methylfolate and hydroxycobalamin instead of methyl, it converts slowly and it will start sort of providing them methylation support until you fix the inflammation oxidative stress that's driving down homocysteine. You know, and I'll see... People will come into my clinic, they don't have any sort of gut symptoms or histamine symptoms at all, and they'll just take some activated Bs, no methyls, just flinic and hydroxy, and they'll email me, Joe, I've got a headache. And I'm like, that, you got a histamine problem. Right. Like, you do. I, like, I always go through my questions with them, no, 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 nothing, yep. and then, bang, they, they do. They have... A big problem with, with histamine, as soon as you start methylating, pushing methylation and you break it down, um, the symptoms can sometimes be hidden and they'll come out. Okay, so I want to get on to where do you start a little bit later because yeah. you've, given, you've given us a big clue along the way and it's sort of a, a naturopathic axiom. But, but you've, you've said that B6 is a cofactor for um, cystathione beta synthase. Mm -hmm. And... Then you've got serine in there as well, haven't you? Oh, yes, serine. Is that right? Yeah, yes. Or am I thinking about the transsulfuration pathway? Yeah, no, serine is part of that pathway, um, but I can't remember what, what it does. No, that's okay. That's okay. My, my brain going off. It is, no, but it is. It is part of that pathway. It's just so not what, something that I've Let's go back to B6 then. Um, implications of taking high-dose B6 and how high? is mm. good how high is safe and when do you call it well you know the thing with b6 is when you you know the typical pyrrole formulas and this is where i've really learned about this right mm. 250 milligrams or more a day mm -hmm. right you know especially when this has been prescribed without even testing homocysteine in the first place this will start driving the homocysteine down because it just stimulates CBS so so much. Okay, right. so the, the B6 and then it starts dropping homocysteine. So the homocysteine will start to drop. That pathway is upregulated. You know the pathway is upregulated. Like you're just pushing sulfur down that pathway. Mm -hmm. And the thing with sulfur, the symptoms are very sim uh, similar to histamine, like headaches and nausea and um, you know bladder pain stuff like that. Really similar. So when you're taking all this B6, it will just start dropping homocysteine and then you've got all these histamine reactions happening, right? And then you, you, you try and um, you don't have enough homocysteine for methylation. So the B6 is, is problematic. And the other thing is some, when you, with B6, you should only really start with a really small dose, like 15 milligrams because it's just enough to get that to get methylation pathways moving whilst you fix what's causing the low homocysteine even people with oxalate so when b6 is deficient it's very hard to break you, you you build up endogenous oxalate that your own body will start making more oxalate and so sometimes when you take all this b6 without understanding there's an oxalate problem right which, you know, does is, you know, when you Great Plains laboratories talk about this, it, it's oxalates is an underlying cause of pyrrols, right? So if you don't fix the oxalate problem in the gut first, yep. you get all this B6, it's what's well, going to break down oxalate. Right. And, and, and it's going to come out, it comes out as bladder pain and gut pain. Yeah, so, so a lot of, I see a lot of women with bladder pain and gut pain recurrent urinary tract infections from taking all these high-dose base B6 because it just keeps breaking down oxalate, breaking it down, 
and they don't have enough calcium to bind the oxalate for excretion. Yeah. It binds it up so that you it, it doesn't cause damage. And then they take all these basics and they have um, a worsening of the oxalate problems that were never you, identified in the first place. Then you've also got a risk of, like long term, you've got a risk of renal stones, haven't you? With high oxalate. Yeah, that's right. causes kidney stones. Oxalate causes kidney stones, definitely. Yeah. Yep, renal stones, it does. Uh, in fact, you see, it's so interesting. There's so often a family history. <laughs> Okay, so would you advocate then instead of calcium to bind the oxalates, would you ad advocate magnesium and B6? You would do, what you do for oxalates is you give calcium citrate and magnesium citrate ah, right. because it to, to help um, break down, to help bind up the oxalate. Right. But the really interesting thing with the calcium though is, you know, if you've got issues with fat malabsorption, right which can actually happen with if you don't have enough taurine because that makes bile acids methylation is also important for making bile acids you have fat malabsorption and fats bind up your calcium okay people with SIBO often have dysregulated bile acids right binds yeah. up your calcium so you don't have enough calcium available to bind the oxalate and, and the, the, I love treating oxalates because it's a really tricky but clinically not that hard to treat. So calcium, magnesium, citrate to help break down and bind up the oxalates um, can work really, really, really well for these people. And you just got to take them off all the B6 if they're on too much B6, just a little bit, like 15 to 20 milligrams is, is usually enough. So with, with B6, you've got to think about why are you low in B6? Why do you need so much B6? You know, because it's widely sp spread out in food. It's not like B12 where you need, you know, animal protein and really good amounts of hydrochloric acid. You know, the reason B6 is low is usually due to an upregulation of, of CBS pathway, re requirement for glutathione or um, oxalates, which are, which are really increasing your need for B6. Do you find so the... That. Yeah. Sorry, forgive me. Say again. But it's it's fixing that pathway to free up your B6. Yeah, I, th I think that the temptation is always to use something as a target rather than a marker. So if you see it low, hit it. <laughs> um, yeah. I was going to ask a question about the testing laboratories. Do you find that they give adequate explanations of the clinical implications of low and high homocysteine or even low or high B6, for instance? Or do we need to be really on our game ourselves about the implications of high and low B6, not just to, you know, you see low, you hit it, you give it B6, rather than yeah. delve into why? Oh, absolutely, because a lot of the labs will look at, um, at just look at results and, and, and sort of say you need to take this supplement, this, this dosage, um, and you really need to sit down, look at your patient and understand why they've got a deficiency yeah. in these nutrients. You know, one of the classic, you know, classic thing I see is organic acids tests, which will bring up low oxalate. But it'll, every, with what, it'll bring up low, low um, vitamin uh, C. And the reason you've got low vitamin C if you've got low oxalate is because all the vitamin C is going in to make oxalate. So vitamin C will increase oxalate. Right. So you've got low oxalate. And sorry, high oxalate on the test, and you've got yeah. low vitamin C. Yeah. You don't see a good physician that can help you. You just get that test result yourself. I see patients do it, and they supplement with vitamin C. C. Yeah. And all that's doing is increasing oxalate. So, so yeah, uh, yeah, you, you do. You need to delve into all of this stuff. You know, Great Plains do really great educationals around their testing organic acids. Like, you need okay. to sit down. And really do them thoroughly because they're brilliant. There's so much information in there to actually learn. But yeah, you got to do and go and do your own research and learning. You can't just re rely on what the labs say about test results. Now you've said to, that you test for homocysteine very frequently. Do you track the tests during the patient's therapy? Yeah, I, I do, especially when they're coming in um, at sort of under and under six. So, so it's, it's really, really good to see um, and the patients really like to see an improvement in results. So when homocysteine is low, it's say, you know, 4, 4.5 and they've got chronic, chronic gut issues, you know, you can actually see the results move up. You can see the homocysteine come back up to a healthy level of like 7. It's hard to do it, you know, it's hard to do it with endometriosis because just the chronic nature of that 
inflammation is it's 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 hard but um yeah you can often see improvements you can get up from like four to six you can you can do that and especially if you're providing n-acetylcysteine or glutathione to these patients to take the load off homocysteine and then they'll methylate better too and is six the sweet spot between oh, it's six, between six and six and eight between six okay. and eight. yeah i mean seven's ideal but if someone's got a homocysteine at six i'm not going to be that focused on it gotcha and yeah. oxalates what about the levels Oh, the levels in testing. Testing and levels. Oh, I don't know. It's just signs, signs and symptoms, Andrew, for Oxalate. Gotcha. Like, I don't even worry about that. You know, I've got well, so let's many. Go, let's go through a few of them, the signs and a symptoms few. of high oxalate. Okay. So it's definitely things got to do with the bladder and then urethra. So it will cause bladder pain, bladder burning, recurrent urinary tract infections, um, vulvodynia. Because of the yeast component, it will also cause um, recurrent thrush. Right. Okay. It causes uh, pain which is sharp in the gut, usually. Gut pain that's sharp um, and it will cause joint pain, you know, widespread pain. Also, classic, really, really interesting, oxalate dumping. So these people don't even know they've got oxalate dumping because they're just, you know, everyone's eating nuts and seeds all the time because it's, yeah. you know, they're on paleo diet and they're good snacks. But they start eating a lot of oxalates and then their body will try and dump them and it will cause flu-like symptoms. Just gland, you know, the glands are up, yeah. sort of a feeling of malaise is absolute classic sign of oxalate dumping. Clinically, I see this a lot. So... Someone will come in with, you know, SIBO histamine problems, definitely test it. We know for sure all the symptoms, not really sort of, they might not have oxalate symptoms. I'll go through it. They don't really have it. Mm -hmm. They'll go and they'll put themselves on a SIBO low histamine diet, but then they'll just start eating way more nuts than they normally do. Mm -hmm. And then they will present with the malaise symptoms and the joint pain because they're actually having oxalate dumping. It's like, wow, this person has an oxalate problem as, as well. Right. And it's hard because it's SIBO and histamine and, ox, and oxalate and, and all of it. So, but the classic is that is pain. Yeah. Oxalate's sharp, tiny crystals, and they cause a lot of pain. Okay, so we've spoken about it time and time again. Now's the time to open up the Pandora's box. Where do we start <laughs> with therapy? Gut. How do, how do you intervene? <laughs> Yeah, we always start with gut, you know. So low homocysteine, um, you know, identifying the cause. You know, if, you know, most of the time, most of the time my patients will, you know, they've just got um, some, some gut issues that need to be identified or sort of an inflammatory condition like endometriosis. So, you know, and the endo girls often have, you know, they've always got gut issues too, right? So we start with gut, whether it's SIBO or large bowel dysbiosis. We need to start working on, you know, the sort of, protocols that most, all clinicians have to help to help with gut um you know if there are oxalates you need to um you need to make sure you do a stool test because um rather than just testing for oxalates because it's signs and symptoms and yeast definitely do that combined with low homocysteine so you've got like you're not enough b6 okay so you need to start working on gut um if they can tolerate sulfur which, which most people can, you know, the, the not tolerating sulfur thing is, is clinically you don't see it that, that often. Well, well, I don't anyway, okay? So you would, um, you know, get these patients on some N-acetylcysteine or some glutathione, right? So whilst you're working on the gut to reduce inflammation, oxidative stress, support glutathione production so that homocysteine um, is, is, is not, you've got the cysteine to free up homocysteine. So homocysteine will then sort of go on to start supporting um, production of SAMI as long as you've got B12, right, because we need B12 to take homocysteine around to methionine with folate. And lo and behold, what do you need to have good B12 levels? You need good gut. Yeah, yeah. So things like, you know, like hydrochloric acid, betaine hydrochloride to help, help break down protein and get some more B12, um, that will help sort of start bringing your homocysteine around for, for methylation. But gently, you know, it, it's, it's gentle because 
when these gut, even oxalates cause, cause huge histamine problems. You know, of course, they're damaging the gut. They're causing a lot of inflammation and mass cell release of histamine. Right? So if you just start pushing methylation too quickly before you fix these issues, mm. then that's when you get a lot of side effects from, from, giving, from giving the methyls. So yep. just, I usually just start with some activated Bs, like just, like, just a, like a small dose, except I'll go high on B12 if they really need it, like a liposomal hydroxycobalamin okay. to help B12 levels up. And speaking of sulfur, look, do you give things like MSM, which is uh, renowned for if people take the full dose first day, they'll get nauseous. Um, yeah, and, the sulfur. The sulfur is, um, you know, it's the ep you, you got to fix the oxides, right? right. You've got to get calcium, magnesium, citrate, really, and and just get the very high oxalate foods out of the diet. Fix the gut. That's really good for getting on top of oxide issues. So then you're not dumping your sulfur. Then um, it's Epsom salt baths with sulfate because sulfate is the end product. So if people need support with salt, the sulfation pathway, the end, the end product with the sulfur gets converted um, into sulfite and then into the sulfate. sulfate, yeah. If you give Epsom salt baths, like you just start with a little foot bath, nothing too high, not a high dose, and just for like, you know, depends how, you know, 20 minutes and that will give the sulfate. So it bypasses the entire pathway. Often people will feel good having those Epsom salt baths to support sulfation whilst you're trying to fix that pathway. Right. Yeah. And, and so I mentioned MSM. You've also got, of course, broccoli sprout extracts and indeed broccoli um, and your, your sulfur-containing or brassica group of vegetables. Um, and then, of course, eggs. Um, yeah, of course. And, and other meats yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, you need meth it's methionine creates homocysteine, and methionine is a sulfur-based amino acid, and it's it's in meat. Right. But you got to get them. To you got to get these people eating meat. You got to get the hydrochloric acid up because they say, "Oh, you know, I, I can't eat red meat. I don't feel good on it." It's like, well, you know, it's, well, maybe it's a bit of sulfur, but it's usually because they don't have enough hydrochloric acid. Right. So they stop eating meat. They like, they didn't tolerate it because the hydrochloric acid's so low because they've. The gut, they're, they're so stressed and their gut's so stressed out that they've produced the hydrochloric acid. Oh, there you've got oh, vagal oh, stuff yeah. in there as well. As well. <laughs> Pardon? You, well, you've got vagal, vagal nerve stimulation in there as well now. Yeah. Um, can I ask, though, you mentioned betaine hydrochloride to stimulate stomach acid, but, of course, betaine is involved in the homocysteine cycle as well. Can yeah. that be playing a function yeah. in yeah, right it's great. fast or helping? Oh, no, it, it helps. I find it helps. Um, you know, it's it, the 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 only sort of side effect you've, I've seen from giving hydrochloric acid will be uh, a flare up of gastritis if it's there, or um, if the histamines are too high, it will cause a lot of reflux because his, histamine stimulates hydrochloric acid. Gotcha. Big cause of reflux, massive cause of reflux and heartburn. So if you you need to get the histamines down first, yeah, and then you can go in with. Um, betaine hydrochloride but that's right the betaine helps um convert homocysteine to methionine shoot through the short route so yeah. that's, that's it's usually really helpful for so killing two birds with one stone supporting the product supporting homocysteine to methionine to make sam as well as providing the hydrochloric acid needed to break down the protein and, and of get course your we, we all think that the uh, fermented foods are totally healthy but of course they're high in histamines <laughs> so yeah, so the same like distance. Oh, honestly, yeah, they are. You know, and, and everyone has to go. You know, like the, the more the better. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, fermented foods for most people with gut issues initially are just a disaster because, you know, if you've got SIBO, you've got you're very likely to have problems with histamine. If you've got oxalates, you've got problems with histamine. It's just you know, in any sort of large bowel dysbiosis is inflammation. It's going to cause reduction in Dow enzyme and you're going to eat all these foods that are super high in histamine and it just overloads your system with histamine. And these people feel terrible. Banging migraines, they feel very irritable. They've got severe insomnia. Histamine increases estrogen. They have horrendous PMS. So it's, yeah, it's, and people, what will they do? They'll have kombucha, they'll have bone broth, They'll have fermented foods, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they, they just really overdo it. 
So, you know, it, these foods are lovely and helpful once all the inflammation and histamine is down to sort of, you know, bone broth in particular. Just like I just do a two-hour broth once people's histamine levels are low to help sort of gut repair. But, um, yeah, it's clinically I see it all the time. It's, it's really prevalent in Sydney. People are doing it all the time and it's making them a hell of a lot worse. Yeah. It's a, like it's amazing stuff because it's really it's flipping my mind. Um, <laughs> the, the things that we thought were all good are questionable. But I, indeed I've seen it with things like, you know, fermented foods um, where we expect a, a healthy outcome and indeed you get the reverse happening. Um, what's really interesting to me is how it can it, um, quite quickly impact on things like migraines and and bladder issues. I think they're these, mm. I don't know if they're pathognomonic, but but certainly there'd be uh, hallmarks that I'd be watching out for. What about oh. caveats, caveats and cautions? What are the worst things that you see happen? What do we need to be aware of? Um, okay, so high dose basics, you know, for these pyrrole compounds. Right. You know, like it's quite frankly, I don't, you know, I, I question my patients if they're on them. Is it helping? Is it helping with the mood? I question about oxalates, you know, so much. The other thing is B6 takes histidine and converts it into histamine. Right. Right. Then you need Dow or histamine methyltransferase to get rid of it. So, you know, I think a lot of people think the cofactor for, Dow is B6, but I, I, it's not. It, it makes histamine a hell of a lot worse. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, I've, I, everyone's hit saying the cofactor for Dow is B6. I can't find the research on it. And absolutely, histidine is converted into histamine with B6. Yeah. I mean, this is something yeah. that I've never understood because previously in a long while ago, um, you used to be able to get histidine in these, um, you know, garlic, vitamin C and horseradish supplements for sinus. And yeah, they yeah. need to work quite well. Why is that? <laughs> I, you know, I don't I remember working at the health shop. They, I don't know. Either. I'll have to think about that. Yeah, um, it's a funny one. Because, yeah, I don't know. I, I do remember working at the health food shop saying that. I don't know. I have to yeah. think about that. Yeah. yeah sure. so, so be careful with, be, be careful with B6. Test homocysteine before even starting with methylation. So often I see people, oh, you got MTHFR, take methyl guard, right? It's designed to lower his homocysteine. That's what that supplement's designed for. And there's a lot of other supplements that are the same. And it's just dropping your, your homocysteine and even lower. So don't start even looking at methylation and supporting your patients with methyls, methyl B12, methyl folate, SAMI before you know what your homocysteine levels are because it just can make them feel so much worse. Um, but, you know, s suicidal thoughts and tendencies and, and really paranoia, can, it can be really quite quite a serious adverse reaction. So you just mm. got to be really careful. So that's yeah. something to be really aware, um, I guess, changes in mental state of our patients. Uh, I am anyone that comes in has it's sort of, I, I, you know, feeling a bit melancholy, a little bit a little bit anxious, just a little bit, don't know, oh, but I'm having a fight with my boyfriend, I don't know, but I'm normally not this anxious. It's like, are you taking methyls? Yes. When did you start them? Oh, two weeks ago. When did you start feeling anxious? Oh, two weeks ago. Right, okay. I just, I'm really, I'm so hyper aware of it, Andrew, because of the adverse reactions that I've seen. So and time I always between starting a supplement and symptom presentation? The time. Time oh, lag between starting. Oh, it can be, it, oh, it can be instantaneous. Right. Especially with methyls. Right. With Sammy, yeah. I never, I never give methyls without niacin. So niacin will stop uh, over methylate, well, you know, over methylation, but a, a, a methylation pathway that's been stimulated too much when it shouldn't be. Yep. Or it should be, it needs to be, but not. They've, they've got blockages. Right. Niacin will stop the methylation reaction, and it will stop the the anxiety, the insomnia, the nausea, the heart palpitations, the headache, or you know, the the, the mood changes. So you really need to look at pro providing your patients with niacin, which will help stop methylation if it you, if they, if it goes too quickly, too fast. Do you give niacin as in nicotinic acid, nicotinamide, or niacinamide? Nic nic um no. The acid form, the itchy form. No, not the itchy form. Right. 
the amide. I can't, it's nicotinamide. Yeah. Yeah, amide. yeah, yeah, yeah. You can yeah, that works just as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that works just as well. Well, but I always get them to take it with food anyway. <laughs> right. I just don't. I just yeah. So you. That's the thing with methylation is you. You nice and will stop it, and you need to support your patients with, you know, taking starting really low dose. You know, low dose methylfolate. Like you can get um, like a hundred micrograms. You start on hundred micrograms and pulse it up. Sammy's the same. You start on two hundred micrograms. That's the smallest dose you can buy. I'm sh- I think. Yeah. Terribly coated, so you can't cut it. You just start on low dose, Sammy, and pulse it up because you know if you go in too hard too quickly, you, people are highly likely to have an adverse reaction, a serious one. They feel terrible. They they feel confused. They're scared. They don't trust you. So it's just slowly, slowly, slowly. It's, it's yeah. a lot better approach. Yeah. Where can naturopaths learn more about what to do properly? Do you have you ever thought about writing a course or do you have any I'm writing, resources? I'm writing a, well, I'm writing a book on histamine at the moment. Right. I'm writing a book. Okay. So right. I've started doing that. It's a big <laughs> project. Page one. <laughs> um, I've done I've, yeah, I don't know. I've done a lot of I've I've doing a lot of research. Right. It is, you know, histamine is so fascinating. It's the most researched molecule in science and it it's just not well known. Outside of pharmaceuticals, yeah, they're looking for receptors and drugs to treat things. So it's, it's a lot of information on on um, histamine. So I'm I'm going through that, but I want to just this is a but this is a book not for clinicians. It's a book for patients for people that really need help. So I'm dumbing it. I'm well, not dumbing it down. I'm just putting in layman's terms in and I'm yeah. looking at all the things that um, clinically I find really helpful for treating histamine, which is absolutely gut stuff. You know, the, the, the SIBO stuff is huge when it comes to histamine, dysbiosis, you know, the um, fermentable carbohydrates. You know, there's no point in getting someone on a low histamine diet when they're just eating FODMAPs and starch, resistant starch, feeding the bugs. That, that causes histamine big time. Right. So it, it more, it's, a lot of my, it's going to be a lot of my clinical knowledge and, um, you know, a, along with the research and it's going to be more, more for patients to sort of, try to get an understanding on how to get on top of this stuff because histamine is a huge problem globally i have patients all around the world like in egypt in abu dhabi canada all over the place the us um with huge histamine problems and it's just the a lot of physicians don't know a lot about it mm. and um you know anyone with gut issues and inflammation you, you're gonna you're very likely to have a histamine problem and this is these are the people we see this is chronic inflammation this is what naturopaths are good at is treating chronic inflammation. So mast cells are released as part of the inflammation cascade and they release histamine. So, so we need to be looking at it. Two things. Firstly, you really need to develop a clinician's course to go alongside the book. I know. The <laughs> second, second one is what, what you've done is quite amazing because normally we, we think about our, our or we, we assume our local environment for our patients, which are usually near to us. You're dealing with people globally that have vastly different cultural and dietary intakes. Mm. So that's no mean feat what you're doing. Like, this is huge. Yeah, no, I do. I, But I really love it because I, le- I learn so much from, from these patients. And, um, you know, I guess... We, you know, my, my, I've got patients in Abu Dhabi and Egypt, but they, they are so into natural medicine. Right. And they're so, they, and they listen to podcasts. They know, they know so much. They know all about all the different um, functional medicine testing that needs to be done. They know all about products. They, they're really, really well educated on, on this stuff. So it's, it's just really interesting to, to talk to them and understand that globally, the need for naturopathic medicine is really, really in demand, and yeah, you know, I hope they embrace their cultural, uh, or oh, historical it, of, of herbs. I does. It, they really like it. it, especially the women. It's part of their 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 proud. They're proud to be yep. sort of provide that for their family. Mm. So um, yeah, no, it's um, it's a really, really interesting. But I just, I you know. Oh, I have just a story. I had a patient in New York and she had huge histamine issues, but neurological histamine. Like she would be, she'd get the dizziness and the vertigo uh, and 
which comes with and nausea. It's coming from the brain, right? Um, can't regulate a body temperature. That's a really interesting, that's a big histamine symptom. People, people that can't control body temperature. Living in New York in the middle of winter and she would go from hot to cold, right? So she'd, she'd walk out, she'd be in the bus or warm in a puffer jacket and then she'd go outside in the freezing cold in New York and then her, she just couldn't regulate, her body temperature would just throw out, the dizziness, the vertigo would start and she'd nearly pass out. Wow. And she she looked at histamine a lot and she was kind of doing a low histamine diet, but what she was eating um, was rice and rice noodles. Right, and right. all that starch was feeding the SIBO, right? And it was just stimulating histamine. It's getting into her brain. And because of the New York temperature changes, it's extreme there, hot to cold, cold to hot, she, she would just nearly pass out every time she did that. So it's just fascinating to see, and I say, like, oh, that is you. You got to get that rice out of your diet because that's driving that, and and it fixed it really, really quickly. So it's just interesting to see in different environments, you know, how histamine is going to actually manifest as quite extreme symptoms. Mm. Seriously, there's so many questions. I have to ask one last one though, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and that is, do you ever, do you ever test microbiota? Oh yeah, I always do microbiome tests. And do yeah, you yeah. find variations or modulation of the microbiota with dietary antecedents? Oh, in different. Oh, in different countries. In different oh, countries, just, and indeed in Australia, yeah. Oh. I would so love to see that. I know. I think that would. I can't answer that because I just think it's too. That that's a re, That's a database. You have yeah. to do a spreadsheet on that. Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah. Until tomorrow. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I don't know, but I'm definitely looking at the gut microbiome, and you know, I'm really looking for all those histamine releasing bacteria. You know, all the, you know, the sort of the, all the, you know, when we're looking at histamine, that bifidobacteria is so important for breaking it down. Yeah. And and oxalate. So I'm I'm looking a lot at what's going on with the with dysbiosis, right. and I look at SIBO all the time because the Dow enzyme that breaks down histamine, what's it's in the gut, but a lot of it is in the small intestine. So I'm looking at that all the time when it comes to, to histamine. So much more to learn. Joanne Kennedy, thank you so much for giving us just, it's, it's like I'm just opening my eyes into this oh, new world. But, <laughs> but thanks so much for giving us an insight into your work because it's, it's, not just, it's not just locally groundbreaking. This is globally groundbreaking what you're doing because you're helping people around the world and 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 jumping that cultural sort of barrier if you if you like because you're helping these people in Egypt and New York and that have vastly different diets even even the availability of food so what you're doing is yeah. quite amazing thanks so much for taking us through some of it today on FX Medicine welcome thanks Andrew this is FX Medicine I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. Thanks for listening. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or Spotify. You can also let us know what further topics you'd like us to cover by contacting us through our website, fxmedicine.com.au or by connecting with us on Facebook or Instagram.